bright star. Lord, I was steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart. Manner and dates in argosy transferred from fairs and space, daintest every one from silk and Samarkand to cedar Lebanon. Thank you for coming along to our very intimate um, uh, gathering uh, this afternoon. We're making a movie because, uh, because of the restrictions on the number of people who come in. We want to try and share uh, this program of the works uh, of Keats and Shelley with a, with a wider audience. Um, and it wouldn't be the same without you, I promise. So uh, thank you for allowing me to share my enthusiasm and passion for, for the work of these two poets. Uh, Giuseppe suggested that I did play Percy Bysshe Shelley uh, in 1986, which I can remember very clearly. Um, but even though I'd studied um, Keats and Shelley at school, I didn't, I didn't really, uh, I didn't have the maturity to understand their maturity. I had this impression of them as sort of willowy, middle distant, fae, and that the, the notion of romantic poetry was, uh, couldn't compete with the kind of Sturm und Drang poets like Ted Hughes and Harold Pinter, who I was uh, drawn to. Um, so it was um, a privilege when uh, Giuseppe asked me to reconsider their work and prepare a preface for, for this, for this uh, anthology. Uh, and the discovery for me, and to my shame, I, I hadn't appreciated it before, of just how modern they were, how muscular, the passion, the vigor, the vitality, the depth of feeling in, in politics, in philosophy, the, the, the understanding of uh, um, big nature. Uh, in their work it is such an elemental uh, theme, uh, as we will hear. Keats and Shelley had that in common. They didn't have a great deal else in common. Uh, socially, uh, Keats from a middle class background, he dropped out of his medical studies, even though he was a good student, to follow his vocation to be uh, a, a poet. He moved to the then little bohemian village of Hampstead, north of London. It was uh, mostly a collection of farms and cottages. Um, and, uh, but there, were, there he was in the company of writers, artists, musicians, people who seemed to have you know, caught the beatnik time of uh, his Regency London. Um, Shelley was uh, born into the aristocracy, went to Eton, to Oxford, had private uh, money. Uh, but at Oxford, he really discovered his voice as a, a sort of renegade rebel pamphleteer. On first arriving, he, he wrote a treatise on the necessity of atheism, which he had nailed to every church door and the bishop's residence. He was uh, expelled, sent down. His father disinherited him. And um, of, of, uh, as far as he could, he only maintained contact through lawyers. At that point, he was still receiving money. Uh, it was later he renounced his income when people were accusing him of being what would today be called a, a champagne socialist, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> which um, put him very much on the, uh, the, the, made him very much a dependent on his friends. Both Keats and Shelley had a keen appreciation of the classical world. They both spent time at the uh, British Museum whenever there were exhibitions of new imports of terracottas and marbles. When Keats began to publish, his poetry was derided and dismissed. And it was an enormous source of encouragement and meaning when he heard from Shelley 
this great sort of uh, celebrated uh, writer of pamphlets, um, how much he appreciated and respected Keats' work. He saw the, the genius in it. Um, and they became friends. I've said before, it would be a little bit like a busker in the piazza uh, outside being visited by John Lennon or, or Bob Dylan and told, you know, you're cool, let's, uh, let's work together. We'll hear first a poem uh, by John Keats. It's called Happy is England. W within this, <clears throat> he's, he's not being entirely ironic, um, <laughs> although there are good reasons to interpret it that way, particularly um, as Shelley uh, later, uh, in the later works we hear, identifies the tremendous social division in, in England. Um, but here he's given voice to his sort of sense of wanderlust. He did travel to Scotland and the Lake District in better health, but his final years were he was really sort of um, not exactly bedridden, but certainly housebound in Hampstead. Um, but there is a lyrical wonder at the, the, the nature of the warm south, the exotic beyond. Happy is England. Happy is England. I could be content to see no other verdure than its own, to feel no other breezes than are blown through its tall woods with high romances blent. Yet do I sometimes feel a languishment for skies Italian and an inward groan to sit upon an alp as on a throne and half forget what world or worldling meant. Happy is England, sweet her artless daughters, enough their simple loveliness for me, enough their whitest arms in silence clinging. Yet do I often warmly burn to see beauties of a deeper glance and hear their singing and float with them about the summer waters. So this yearning, this churning, this erotic desire for that which was beyond his reach. I mentioned he was a keen classicist um, and spent time at the British Museum. Uh, Ke Keats did this little drawing which we've used as the front cover. It, it's, the sketch is next door. Um, it's not from a, a, a vase in the British Museum. It's actually a, a copy of something which was exhibited in the, uh, the Louvre and printed from there. On first looking into Chapman's Homer, much have I travelled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told, that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene, till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when, with eagle eyes, he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. Chapman was a 17th century translator of, of Homer. Uh, but thought to be authoritative. Um, I, I mentioned their belief in big nature as this animistic force. Uh, I think both Keats and Shelley today would be uh, active members of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, they were radically um, of the belief that the uh, Industrial Revolution harvesting um, the population from rural lifestyles and bringing them into the new mills and factories of the emerging new cities was a great evil uh, which was um, uh, betraying the 
the, 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 co the correct state of humanity to exist in balance with nature. This is um, a poem he wrote about the Lake District, addressed to his friend Benjamin Robert Hayden. Great spirits now on earth are sojourning, he of the cloud, the cataract, the lake who on Helvellyn's summit, wide awake, catches his freshness from archangel's wing, he of the rose, the violet, the spring. And other spirits there are standing apart upon the forehead of the age to come. These, these will give the world another heart and other pulses. Hear ye not the hum of mighty workings? Listen a while, ye nations and be dumb. Uh, about three years ago, the fracking was introduced into an area of the Lake District and there were um, tremendous protests from local uh, residents, uh, one of whom read this poem at one of their gatherings. Um, shortly after, some, the seismic activity was uh, measured have been such an increase that the, the fracking was ordered stopped. But I like to think it's because somebody had heard the words of uh, Keats. Um, Endemian, a poetic romance, uh, is, is a very long meditation on so many aspects of the mythological and natural world. I'm just going to read a few lines, you may well know them, because they, if Keats had a manifesto, they are expressed in these lines. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It will never pass into nothingness, but still will keep a bower quiet for us and asleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing, an endless fountain of immortal drink pouring onto us from heaven's brink. Keats uh, is known for some of his longer ballads, um, and these had such a sort of romantic intensity. They were hugely influential on the Paraphylite Brotherhood. Uh, Holman Hunt and Millet and Waterhouse all made images uh, from, from um, Keats's work. And I asked Duncan Wu, who edited this book, if I were to choose one of these to, to read from, which should it be? And he was absolutely uh, immediate in his response. And so well, it has to be St. Agnes Eve, and it has to be very specifically in the stanzas you're about to hear. And I asked him why, and he replied that they were the sexiest things ever written in the English language. So settle down, even though <laughs> you have your masks on. Um, I'll set the scene. Uh, the, it's a courtship by Porphyro of, of Madeline. And finally, at uh, verse 29, Porphyro has got Madeline to come over to his place, but, which she's done, but she's promptly fallen asleep. That's, and he's in a quandary of pent-up, um, wondering what to do. Then by the bedside, where the faded moon made a dim silver twilight, Soft he set a table, and half anguish drew thereon a cloth of woven crimson, gold, and jet. Oh, for some drowsy Morphian amulet! And still she slept, an azure lidded sleep, in blanched linen, smooth and lavendered, while he from forth the closet brought a heap of candied apple, quince, and plum and gourd, with jellies soother than the creamy curd and lucent syrups, tinks with cinnamon, manner and dates in argosy transferred from fez, and spiced dainties every one, from silken samarkand to cedared Lebanon. These delicates 
he heaped with glowing hand on golden dishes and in baskets bright of wreathed silver. Sumptuous they stand in the retired quiet of the night, filling the chilly room with perfume light. And now, my love, my seraph fair, awake. Thou art my heaven, and I thine eremite. Open thine eyes for meek Saint Agnes' sake, or I shall drowse beside thee, so my soul doth ache. Thus whispering, his arm, unnerved, sank in her pillow. Shaded was her dream by the dusk curtains. T'was a midnight charm, impossible to melt as iced stream. The lustrous salvers in the moonlight gleam, broad golden fringe upon the carpet lies. It seemed he never, never could redeem from su such a steadfast spell his lady's eyes. So mused a while, entoiled in woofered fantasies. Awakening up, he took her hollow lute, tumultuous and in chords that tenderest be. He played an ancient ditty long since mute in Provence called La Belle Dame Sans Merci. Close to her ear, touching the melody, wherewith disturbed she uttered a soft moan. He ceased, she panted quick, and suddenly her blue afraid eyes wide open shone. Upon his knees he sank, pale as smooth sculptured stone. Ah, Porphyro, said she, but even now thy voice was at sweet tremble in mine ear made tunable with every sweetest vow, and those sad eyes were spiritual and clear. How changed thou art, how pallid, chill, and drear. Give me that voice again, my Porphyro, those looks immortal, those complainings dear. Oh, leave me not in this eternal woe, for if thou diest, my love, I know not where to go. Beyond a mortal man, impassioned far at these voluptuous accents. He arose, ethereal, flushed, and like a throbbing star seen mid the sapphire heaven's deep repose, into her dream he melted, as the rose blendeth its odour with the violet, solution sweet. Meantime, the frost wind blows like love's alarum, pattering the sharp sleet against the window panes. Saint Agnes' moon hath set. Well, if you'd like to know what happened next, you will <laughs> have to get your own copy and read on. Um, another of the, the poems which um, um, Keats is very known for of uh, this sort of romantic ballad uh, he makes a, a bit of a joke of in that. He, he talks about uh, a little ditty he sings long since forgotten from Provence called La Belle Dame Sans Merci, but that's actually uh, one of his poems. And um, it's not clear who finds this ailing gentleman on the hillside. Is it a man? Is it a woman? What station they are? But for me, I always have in my mind an image of a, uh, of a female farm worker out bringing in the cows who comes across this, you know, quixotic figure. Um, La Belle Dame Sans Merci. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard and so woebegone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy's song. She found me roots of relish sweet, 
and honey wild and manna dew. And sure in language strange she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses for. And there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed ah, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hill's side. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, Death pale were they all, they cried, La belle dame sans mercy hath thee in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam, with horrid warning gaped wide. And I awoke and found me here on the cold hillside. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering, though the sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Uh, I mentioned uh, Keats um, uh, dropped out of his medical studies after he completed his apothecary training, uh, which meant he was certainly familiar with the um, uh, the effects of uh, medicinal opiates and having retained something of a license he was able to fill the prescriptions to himself on a fairly regular basis I, I think to medicate for his the pain of the TB from which he suffered but it also uh, I think he was willfully seeing what it unlocked in his imagination um, this Next poem was written in the garden of what today is called the Keats House in Hampstead. It's, it's a museum and has some wonderful uh, memorabilia. It doesn't have the feeling of Keats that this apartment has. Here I, I, I sort of, I feel he could pop through that door at any moment. It's a very, very powerful presence. But the garden there was immensely important to him and a newly planted mulberry tree uh, he took great interest in and sitting beneath it he wrote Ode to a Nightingale. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute passed and leithwards had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my sole self. Adieu. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is fain to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades, past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? And continuing to explore this uh, interactive feeling of mythology with the with the uh, with the present day um, bucolic bliss he was yearning for, as well as his his philosophy, he wrote "Ode on a Grecian Urn." It's been speculated which urn was the source of the inspiration. I like to think it was what was known as the Buckingham Vase, a huge, um, uh, massive um, uh, limestone uh, urn found here in Rome, taken first to the British Museum and exhibited from where it was bought by William Randolph Hearst and taken to his Xanadu in California, San Simeon. And from there it made its way to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Ode on a Grecian Urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, 
thou foster child of silence and slow time. Sylvan historian, who can thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme, what leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape, of deities, or mortals, or of both, in Tempe, or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? O oh, Attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed. Thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought, as doth eternity. Cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woes than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. The final poem we will hear by Keats um, is a popularly uh, thought to be a love declaration to Fanny Braun, the girl next door. At a certain point, rather than put the rent up for Keats and his pals, the builder, the owner of the house, uh, uh, cut the little villa in half and another family moved in next door. That was Mrs. Braun and her daughter Fanny. And Keats, who was ailing during this period, but spent a lot of time on the daybed looking out into the garden, saw this vision of Fanny walk across, and he, he sort of swooned at first sight. He would later that day listen to her footsteps through the partition wall, hearing her skirts swish across the floor, which doesn't say a lot for the building codes of the time, but uh, it was the beginning of an intense courtship. And at a certain point, Mrs. Braun, who was a progressive woman, said, look, Keats, I know uh, you love my daughter and she loves you, so consider yourselves engaged and come our side of the partition, live with us. But you can't marry until you prove to me you can recover your health and earn a living um, and in a, you're in a position to, to keep Fanny. And that's what motivated his final journey here to Rome. Uh, Giuseppe uh, talked about, it was just, I think, next Wednesday, the 200th anniversary of his setting out. It took me two hours to fly from London to Rome. It took him two months, it was steadily deteriorating on the way. Their love had reached a point of great intensity and, and commitment, but so in such despair was Keats when he arrived here in this apartment that the many letters which Fanny wrote to him, sharing love and support and belief, all went unread. And the letters he wrote to her all went unposted. He was in the great grip of um, melancholy, knowing that his dream uh, life, his dream relationship, wasn't going to um, develop as he'd hoped. And such was his despair that to his traveling companion and dear friend Joseph Seven, artist whose work you will see in these rooms, he said, on my tombstone, just say, here lies one whose name was writ in water. And, and thus it was for, I should think, 60 years before um, the sort of the Keats fan base insisted that his name be uh, um, placed above those words. And uh, indeed, if you haven't visited, do go to the non-Catholic cemetery and pay your respects. We did a reading there once, and uh, it was um, very powerful and uh, profound. Um, but this poem, Bright Star, 
uh, always associated with Fanny, although research has shown that Keats did try it out on a few other girls first with some success. But uh, I only ever think of Fanny, Bright Star. Bright Star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient, sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores, or gazing on the new soft-fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast, to feel forever its soft swell and fall, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear her tender taken breath, and so live ever, or else swoon to death. So before we, we, we consider uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, we have to show some acknowledgement of the third member of the romantic triumvirate, uh, Keats, Shelley, and Byron. And um, the, 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 the house have also published a little collection of um, Byron's work, uh, for which I also wrote the preface um, uh, very happily. Um, <clears throat> I've, Byron in his day was a far, far more um, famous uh, poet than Keats or Shelley. They were dismissed and derided. Byron sold in huge numbers and, um, and people adored him. But um, I've chosen one to suggest um, his work to you, to put it in your minds. And I w it's a tribute to, to womanhood. And uh, um, I want to dedicate it this afternoon, this reading, to Evgenia Sikovitz, the uh, novelist, to whom um, next week I will have been married for 30 years. So, well, I'm not sure she would applaud, but uh, <laughs> there it is for Evgenia. She walks in beauty. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. And on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. Byron. So, Shelley, uh, I, I've told you a little about him, you know, known as a firebrand. I, I'll give you a sense of what the critics made of him in his day. He was described as degraded and perverted. Truly contemptible, licentious, hideous and, nat and unnatural phantasms of wickedness ooze from his pen. Well, it gets your attention, doesn't it? Um, I'll tell you what I wrote in my preface about, about Shelley. Um, the, I'm setting the scene where I just come here from the cemetery. And there too I communed at the grave of Shelley the great Pied Piper of my teenage, 70s, punk, anti-establishment, free-loving, free-spirited, drama student self. Um, but you can see why I was drawn, drawn to him. Um, Sh Shelley was um, <clears throat> much more politically uh, active uh, than, than Keats with his pamphlets, but also in, in his poetry. You could say if Shelley was the intellect, then Keats was the imagination, but that's a very general term. Um, he, he, he was known um, 
as a, a seditious person. The authorities were very um, untrusting of him. He was a marked man. And uh, he also owed money to a lot of people, having renounced his own inheritance on principle. He uh, was on the continent often, staying with Byron, famously on the shores of Lake Geneva at the Villa Diodati, where he and Mary and Polydori and Byron told each other stories resulting in, in Frankenstein from Mary Shelley. Uh, when Byron went to Venice, w Shelley also stayed there, but eventually was drawn to uh, Naples and Tuscany. Um, his animistic certainty about the power and importance of um, the weather, trees, the sky, bodies of water, rock formations, as having a significant and real bearing on our lives was such a modern and, and, and contemporary idea. Uh, in many ways, he was a sort of a yogic guru. One of his pamphlets was about the necessity of a plant-based diet at a time when roast beef was the, um, the, the, the stock. Um, these lines um, were written in the valley of Chamonix, uh, looking at Mont Blanc. Uh, I'm a keen mountain climber and have, have been, indeed climbed Mont Blanc, and I know the truth of, of what he says here. Uh, three weeks ago, I was in the Bernese Oberland climbing, and, uh, and uh, I always wear Montura, an Italian um, uh, manufacturer of mountain outdoor gear. Va lines written in the Valley of Chamonix, looking at Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc yet gleams on high. The power is there the still and solemn power of many sights and many sounds, and much of life and death. In the calm darkness of the moonless nights, winds contend silently there, and heap the snow with breath, rapid and strong, but silently. The secret strength of things which governs thought inhabits thee. And what were thou, and earth, and stars and sea, if to the human mind's imaginings, silence and solitude were vacancy. Um, a keen traveller, loved the company of travellers, always liked to hear travellers' tales, but this next poem was written after a visit to the British Museum, at which Keats may well have been in attendance himself. Uh, looking at uh, an, uh, some Egyptian limestone friezes. Ozymandias. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that it sculpted well those passions red, which yet survive stamped on those lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Hubris, I suppose. Uh, don't you wish um, modern politicians would be more familiar with uh, that poem? Um, uh, I mentioned <clears throat> that um, Shelley uh, went to Naples. He was a keen sailor. He could sail in Naples. Um, and, but in these lines written there in 1818, it's almost a prescient foretelling of his own death uh, less than four years later. Uh, in the film Gothic, uh, which Giuseppe mentioned, in which I played Russell, uh, where I played Shelley, 
Uh, the scene w of his drowning in the Gulf of Spezia was a particularly powerful and haunting uh, uh, occasion. And I always feel I revisit it reading these lines, written in dejection. The sun is warm, the sky is clear, the waves are dancing fast and bright, blue isles and snowy mountains wear the purple moon's transparent might, the breath of the moist air is light, the winds, the birds, the ocean floods, the city's voice itself is soft like solitudes. Yet now despair itself is mild, even as the winds and waters are, I could lie down like a tired child and weep away the life of care which I have borne and yet must bear, till death like sleep might steal on me and I might feel in the warm air my cheek grow cold and hear the sea breathe o'er my dying brain its last monotony. He was also in Naples when he heard the news of the <clears throat> um, massacre at Peterloo in Manchester where uh, some protesting, peacefully protesting uh, workers were subject to um, a charge by the local militia with their sabres drawn and muskets firing and uh, many were killed and many, many more were, were injured. And it almost triggered revolution in England. Shelley was incensed and he, he wrote The Mask of Anarchy. It's a very long poem, but we'll hear a few stanzas. As I lay asleep in Italy, there came a voice from over the sea, and with great power it forth led me to walk in the visions of poesy. I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castle Ray. Very smooth he looked, yet grim. Several bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and well they might be in admirable plight. For one by one and two by two, he tossed them human hearts to chew, which from his wide cloak he drew. And the little children, who round his feet played to and fro, thinking every tear a gem, had their brains knocked out of them. And that slaughter to the nation shall steam up like inspiration, eloquent, oracular, a volcano heard afar. And these words shall then become like oppression's thunder doom, ringing through each heart and brain, heard again, 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 rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number, shake your chains to the earth like dew, which in sleep have fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. That was the favorite poem of both Mahatma Gandhi and Karl Marx, and I'm sure many others. <clears throat> also in Naples, the following year, in 1819, he, he wrote a, a summing up of the England as he saw it. And I stress again, in England, the French Revolution was fresh in the minds of the establishment, but the monarchy, uh, parliament, the military were all very mindful that um, uh, civil war rebellion could, could easily be triggered uh, in, um, in, 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 in their country. And people like Shelley were considered public enemies. There were those who wanted him brought to trial um, for sedition, treasonous offense, capital, a capital crime. Um, and, uh, but Shelley was undaunted. This, this poem, makes the Sex Pistols' God Save the Queen seem like a nursery rhyme. England in 1819. An old, mad, blind, despised and dying king. Princes, the dregs of their dull race, who flow through public scorn, mud from a muddy spring. Rulers who neither see 
nor feel nor know, but leech-like to their fainting country cling, till they drop, blind in blood without a blow. A people starved and stabbed in the untilled field, an army which liberticide and prey makes as a two-edged sword to all who wield religion, Christless, godless, a book sealed, a senate, time's worst statute unrepealed, a graves from which a glorious phantom may burst to illumine our tempestuous day. <clears throat> when I was uh, at school, I remember very clearly being given a homework assignation, which was to compare and contrast uh, Keats' um, Ode to a Nightingale with Shelley's To a Skylark. And uh, uh, something you can do this evening, because <laughs> we're about to hear uh, uh, extracts from Skylark. Uh, a year ago, I, I did a reading here of this poem, and I dedicated it to um, a young woman, uh, Macy Clark, who had um, just passed away in way, way before her, her, her days uh, should have been numbered. And next week, um, her, her stone, her memorial stone, has been set. And again, I dedicate it to Macy Clark, to a skylark. Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher, from the earth thou springest like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest, and singing still dost soar, and soaring ever singest, better than all measures of delightful sound, Better than all treasures that in books are found, Thy skill to poet were, thou scorner of the ground. Teach me half the gladness that thou brain must know, Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow. The world should listen then, as I am listening now. And finally, we're going to hear a, a, a poem many considered to be Shelley's great masterpiece. It was written uh, as a tribute as a, as a, uh, to uh, John Keats when he heard of his death. Uh, Shelley was, although anticipated this news, he was thrown into such grief and such anger at those who had not recognized uh, Keats's value, his worth in the, uh, as an artist. Um, he's called Adonais. This is a name Shelley gives Keats as a homage to his interest in the classical world. It's heroic sounding. But not only does this poem eulogize Keats, it also eulogizes Shelley himself because he was to be dead within a few months of having written it and uh, um, his ashes were buried too in the non-Catholic cemetery not far from, from Keats's. Adonais, an elegy on the death of John Keats. Peace, peace, he is not dead, he doth not sleep, he hath awakened from the dream of life. Tis we who, lost in stormy visions, keep with phantoms an unprofitable strife, and in mad trance strike with our spirit's knife invulnerable nothings. We decay like corpses in a charnel, fear and grief convulse us and consume us day by day and cold hopes swarm like worms within our living clay. Go thou to Rome, at once the paradise, the grave, the city and the wilderness, and where 
Its wrecks like shattered mountains rise, and flowering weeds and fragrant copses dress the bones of desolation's nakedness. Pass till the spirit of the spot shall lead thy footsteps to a slope of green access, where, like an infant's smile over the dead, a light of laughing flowers along the grass is spread. That light whose smile kindles the universe, that beauty in which all things work and move, that benediction which the eclipsing curse of birth can quench not, that sustaining love which through the web of being blindly wove by man and beast and earth and air and sea burns bright, consuming the last clouds of cold mortality. The breath whose might I have invoked in song descends on me. My spirit's bark is driven far from the shore, far from the trembling throng, whose sails were never to the tempest given. The massy earth and sphered skies are riven. I am born darkly, fearfully afar, whilst burning through the inmost veil of heaven, the soul of Adonais like a star beckons from the abode where the eternal are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.